see a circle. Um, <coughs> I'm Ben Packard, and I'm Christian Smith, Pat, with Gary Penwork. Welcome all those online. Um, we are in for another treat today with another practitioner who has done some really interesting work. Kevin Hagan is not only a good friend, but he also, in his day job, is uh, the vice president of environmental social governance strategy at Iron Mountain. He's a graduate of the Presidio Institute, and an MBA in Sustainable Studies, and also a graduate of Clarkson University, where you did a combo engineering and marketing. And uh, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. Okay. Useless in two disciplines. <laughs> <laughs> he right now is teaching along with a last week's feature speaker, um, uh, Kevin Wilhelm, uh, at the Harvard Extension on Sustainable Business Strategy. And um, we are lucky to have him. He's a, he influences a lot of dialogue on sustainable business in various forms he's involved with that we'll talk about. And prior to Iron Mountain, he was REI's head of sustainability. So thank you, Kevin. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Hello. Wow. Real people. <laughs> <laughs> so, no disrespect to those of you online. It's also catered to, to have folks uh, virtually, but wow, real people. That's, uh, that's exciting. So I guess we should start with, has anybody ever heard of Iron Mountain? No. Yes, we have a winner. Shred business. You saw a shred truck. No, I work in purchasing automotive industry, and I was in charge of ISO and the rest Nice. So document data, yeah. uh, yeah. information retention, information repolicies. Any of you have emails from 19-something? No, 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 nobody has that anymore. Well, you're not supposed If you're in a company, you're not supposed to. Um, because um, information management systems across the uh, across the organizations help businesses understand what they got, all those emails, all those contracts, all that information. Time was when all that lived, all that correspondence and all those contracts lived on paper. And Iron Mountain was born some 70 years ago to store paper. Uh, we actually collected all boxes of, uh, of, of documents and of contracts because they have requirements to keep it for a certain amount of time. If it's a health record, you have to keep it for the life of the person. Uh, and that kind of fills up the office pretty quick. So Iron Mountain invented a business to go store that stuff for you and get it back if you need it. And so the people that tend to know Iron Mountain in that sense are accountants, lawyers, folks that put the contracts together. And generally speaking, the lawyers who get it back for discovery when there's a lawsuit or some, somebody needs it. So that was Iron Mountain's origin, origination, and it got pretty big. Um, we're now just about a Fortune 500 company, a little over four, well, about four and a half billion dollars in sales. Um, we're in 60 countries. We operate 1,450 facilities, some 90 million square feet of, uh, of space that's just filled to the gunnels with um, primarily with old people documents. However, you probably noticed that information moved from paper to digital and so did Iron Mountain. So sometime along the way, we became a storage facility for tapes because folks used to download the internet, actually they still do, download the internet to tape for, as a mechanism for storage. So we became a storage, a tape storage business and now we're actually um, uh, becoming a data center business. We're one of the top data center suppliers in the world with um, something called co-load data center services. That is, we actually lease the space inside data centers so that folks can operate their business. There used to be a computer room down the hall, and then there was a data center someplace on campus that doesn't really exist anymore. Data centers are expanding too quickly to capitalize in business. You can't afford to do that. So you generally folks rent space or they go right to the cloud. So, um, so Iron Mountain's business is digital transformation for business. It has all these elements around uh, document information storage and chain of custody. And we have a bunch of ancillary pieces around that. So for example, since we have to pick up your boxes and bring them back, um, we have trucks. So we have 5,000 5, vehicles in the world. Um, so that's Iron Mountain in a nutshell. And that's my advertising for the CD. Now you can now I can afford dinner. So, so, um, so that's a little bit of what we do. Um, about eight years ago, we started to think about what does that what does it mean to be a sustainable business, responsible organization in that context, which is kind of new. 
Now, I noticed that when you guys listed the companies that you're going to be looking at, I think all of them were B to C, right? Business, business to consumer type of organizations. I don't think many of you named B to B or business to business organizations, and that's normal, right? Because that's not what we think of when we. But in fact, most of the Fortune 500 is B to B type organizations, right? So, what does sustainability mean if you don't have Patagonia's customer base, or if you don't have the organic uh, organic section of the produce department? What's what is uh, what does sustainability mean to a company like ours? So we started thinking a lot about it and you guys are thinking about frameworks and we started thinking about frameworks and started to understand what our material issues were, right? There's about 17 sustainable development goals with underlying points in each one, adding up to some 160 odd elements of what the UN would say are, is, is all about sustainability. You can't work on 161 things, right? Um, and although some of them are really important things for the world, they're not that necessarily important to our stakeholders or to our business, right? Um, so, you know, animal rights, really important, not part of our business. So how do we figure out uh, what that is? So we do this process called materiality. And we, you guys have probably studied a little bit of that. We kind of do that process and figure out what our top priorities are. And then we started getting data. Data is really important because before you have data, you really don't have anything, right? You get good intentions. So data became really critical to our process. We started figuring out how to find KP at key performance indicators against all these things like energy use and greenhouse gas emissions and, um, and uh, human rights issues, safety, uh, percentage of women in leadership roles, you know, all kinds of things that we started to think about entirely differently that started out probably as nice to have, touchy-feely, emotional, you know, where that was the accusation of that stuff. What we found out really quickly is when you get some numbers together and you put a light on those aspects of the business that you may not have been paying attention to before, you actually find some unfortunate places. There's pieces you didn't want to know about early. It gets worse before it gets better. However, what we did then connect was these were business questions. We start, for example, greenhouse gas emissions sounded like something that wasn't that important to the world in terms of, you know, who cares? I know I care, trust me. Um, but that would be the, that would be the piece of it, you know, so that would be the stereotype. But when we started really unburying and digging through this greenhouse gas emissions, what we found was a whole lot of business issues that we hadn't seen before. For example, I mean, we want to take a guess at what our biggest source, and when we started, what our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions was? Guesses? What would be, the, what would be a big, uh, we have 5,000 trucks, we have 1,450 facilities. Any guesses? Electricity. Nailed it electricity right and that really surprised us i know that doesn't surprise you it really surprised us because we buy electricity we don't buy coal or oil or natural gas we buy electricity how bad could that be well it turned out that when we looked underneath the covers and found out where our electricity comes from it came from a lot of fossil fuels and in fact underneath that we found that there was a lot of cost volatility the price jumped around a whole lot but we didn't see it because it was masked by our electricity bills. So we had a dependency, a key dependency on a very volatile commodity, but we were not aware of that. And that's a business problem. We also found out that we, our utility expenses went up every year and we didn't exactly know why. We didn't actually know if we were buying more electricity or if we were paying more for it. So we got smart got the data out, figured all that out, and identified ways in which we could use, reduce the amount of electricity we use in the first place, and then started working on renewable energy solutions for our business. So that ended up getting a, you know, being a really important piece of how we were thinking. And it was a great example that when you look at business differently through the lens of environmental and social performance, we can actually find new things about business that leave us to a whole lot of new opportunities. So who's skeptical? 
Can business be part of the answer? <laughs> Question or skeptical? Just skeptical. Skeptical, right? Yeah. I, I am. I have been. <laughs> I have been. I worked in business all my career. I have been. I think that um, that uh, you know it's it's arguable. It's we could we could easily say that business has been part of the problem for a long time. Right. So here's the new paradigm. What if business was part of the solution? And I think that's really the essence of where we can go next. Even Paul Hawken, Paul Hawken, the author of the Ecology of Commerce, co-author of um, natural capitalism. Most recently, um, his work is around um, Project Drawdown, identifying all the ways in which we can go reduce carbon emissions right now. <laughs> um, Paul Hawken said, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but in his, uh, in his original work, he, he said, he looked at business, right? And he said, you know, business has potential. In fact, he said, my paraphrase, Business is the only human institution with the scale, the speed, and the resources to make a big enough difference fast enough to matter. That kind of like sits funny, right? <laughs> it's like, wait, that's the not that's the not so good army, right? Um, how could we turn that into the good news? Right? And I think it's been really challenging in my experience, both at REI and now at, uh, at Iron Mountain, to get our head around the idea that it could be different. And I think it's predicated on a, on a, on a prevailing wisdom, right? the conventional wisdom that you have to choose. It's either you do the right thing or you do the business thing. Right? And that paradigm, that, 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 that trade-off mentality permeates practically everything, even in ways you don't really think of at first. Right? The green product is, more expensive, right? Of course it is, right? Um, the, um, and, and it doesn't always work as well, right? Um, you have to make sacrifices to be sustainable. Right? Um, if you really wanna make a difference, you join a nonprofit, you don't join a corporation. Right? So there's a hundred ways in which everyday life, we reinforce that stereotype or that paradigm and getting past it, reimagining re -imagining the way we do business so that we actually get more good outcomes instead of more bad outcomes is a, is a journey. It's a, it's, a, it's a distinct journey. In fact, um, my uh, you know, Kevin uh, Wilhelm, who spoke so earlier, and I have spent some time thinking about that journey. And I think you guys might have seen some of this material where we think about that five stages of changing a business or of changing our ideas from conventional wisdom at stage one to a first stage where folks are evangelizing and enthusiastic to a stage in the middle where folks are really working on data and starting to institutionalize, operationalize the idea of doing things differently to a fourth stage where folks are starting to really think about the shift from, not to be cute, but from doing less bad to doing more good. And then ultimately there's a fifth stage that has to do with sort of a regenerative economy. The idea of actually everything we do looking a lot more like nature where there's no such thing as waste. Everything, waste is always food for something, right? Um, and that makes sense, right? Because a sustainable business, sustainability, isn't the description of an entity or a thing. You can't have a sustainable tree in my opinion, but you could possibly have a sustainable forest because it's a it's a description it's a, it's a it's like you can't have a one car traffic jam you got to have a system to make that happen and therefore uh, sustainability really is the description of a well functioning system so in that fifth stage we really got to do it together and we really got to think about the ecosystems of business and of commerce in order to really change the ultimate state by the way, in my opinion, nobody's there yet. Nobody's in stage five. Um, however, um, there's a good chunk of folks at stage, you know, there are more folks at stage four today than there ever were. Um, and what's really neat is that there are more businesses getting started than ever before. The, uh, the, the, the pressures from investors, employees, customers, 
communities, NGOs, the, the expectations of business to be part of the solution instead of being part of the problem are really changing everything in the business community today. By the way, not for nothing, as my New York friends say, that's an amazing opportunity for people in your place. Because I think that just sustainability and sustainable business thinking is creating skills and competencies that are new to business. And it's creating a change. It's like a disruptive, it's like a disruptive technology in business. It's like there was a time, you won't believe this, but there was a time when people in business didn't know how to type. <laughs> because they just wrote their notes and then they handed it to a secretary or a secretary pool and a group of women would type like crazy and come back with your memo. That used to happen, right? Um, and there were some folks that didn't want to learn how to type and they were obsolete and they didn't last long. So I think that sustainable business thinking across all industries and professions is starting to create new skills and competencies that are not only making people more valuable, more effective and more successful in their jobs, but they're, have, they're getting to be part of the solution. We no longer have to leave our values in the parking lot to go to work. We can take our whole selves to work and be more effective, more successful and more effect and, and, and actually um, make a bigger difference with our day jobs in the right places at the right times. All right, was that provocative enough? Provocative enough? <laughs> no, you're just like, oh, sure, that way we take that for granted. That's, ex that's exactly what we expect. No, yes. All right, I'm going back to dad jokes. That's it. That's it. All right. Um, I, yes. Please. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so today, yeah, so I think there's skills and competencies. Right? So we, we, in, in academia, we talk about skills and competencies. So let's talk about skills first, hard skills. I think that almost every profession is, in, is being infused by hard skill changes that are necessary to be successful today. In procurement, if you wanna be a procurement professional, you probably really need to know about life cycle assessments and you really need to understand uh, supply chain resiliency. You need to know about fair labor and you need to know about human rights. You need to know about um, uh, issues in the supply chain that are gonna affect whether or not a supplier is actually gonna be a viable supplier in a couple of years. And so that's an example in, this, in, in supply chain. In finance, folks in finance need to know about green bonds and a whole, new, a whole new cadre of financing options around sustainable business, sustainability bonds. I'm gonna argue that eventually, and it's not too far away, um, carbon accounting is actually gonna be a accounting skill. And so I think that, the, that accountants are gonna to start to become analysts and understand what, uh, what, account, what carbon accounting looks like. If you're in real estate or in facilities management and operations, you need to know green building skills. You probably need to be LEED certified or BRIAM certified or know what's going on in the green building space. Um, if you're in marketing, you better know what greenwashing is. It's not just like big, like, oh, that's a greenwasher. Like what is greenwashing according to the FTC's green guides and how do you make sure that your company isn't part of that? Right? So I think every one of these disciplines across the organization is changing. Today, I would say that people with those skills are, um, are, are something special, right? They're, they're adding extra something in those areas. And it's, it's relatively new, but the right organization will recognize it. I think that in some amount of time, that is simply, that's just table stakes for what those professions do for a living. And people who don't have it are obsolete before they know it. So those are skills. Those are hard skill type things. Let's talk about competencies for a second. So competencies, both personal and organizational competencies are kind of new. And these are not rocket science. I'm not going to like you know, throw any you know, revelation at you. But they are definitely competencies that have not historically been strongly rewarded overtly in the business community. Things like empathy systems thinking, being able to lead with influence instead of authority, 
um, being able to understand um, the soft stuff, because the soft stuff is the hard stuff, system change, system thinking, system dynamics. And one of the most important is collaboration. Being able to collaborate inside an organization across silos of the business, but more importantly, what I call hyper collaboration. And that is being able to collaborate with parties outside of the four walls of the business. Learning how to collaborate inside the company or organization is, is really is, is great training, but the next level above that is being able to collaborate with an academic institution or a non, or a non governmental organization, an NGO or nonprofit, or a business that actually isn't a supplier or a customer. We're used to working with suppliers. We tell them what to do, they do it. Um, we call that partnership, right? <laughs> um, we're used to working with customers. They tell us what to do and we do it. They call that partnership. Those power dynamics are pretty clear. How do you collaborate and get stuff done when those power dynamics don't exist? With an NGO, what makes them tick? What do they need out of this relationship? Um, what does an academic institution need out of the relationship with my company? How do we get things done in collaboration? So that's the, I, I think I, I spent a little time on collaboration because I think it's one of the most important ones. I'm going to be a little more controversial. I get in trouble, but I'll, I'm, I'm, it's on live. If one was to stereotype, and I'm not, but if one was to stereotype, um, many of these skill, many of these competencies tend to be associated with female leadership or, or feminine le leadership qualities versus more type A masculine type um, qualities. Stereotypes are always wrong. Don't stereotype. Um, but it's interesting. And, it's, and I think it's an interesting observation in the dynamic of business that these types of skills are growing in appreciation and are growing in actual implementation in the business environment. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that it might correlate with more female leaders in business. And I think, I don't have the data for this, but it's just a personal observation. I'm seeing a lot of women make it um, very high in organizations in the sustainability chain, chief sustainability officer type roles, um, which is pretty interesting. I think, yeah, I think that's true. Um, yeah, and I'm glad that it's not just human resources anymore. <laughs> All right, so that was a little bit of the tour around skills and competencies, and maybe that gives you guys some food for thought about what kinds of things you'd want to study or learn associated with the kind of directions here. I saw, as you know, when we talked about companies, several of you were in apparel industry type folks. If you, you know, that was one of the early, um, early industries thinking a lot about this. It, it got there because a lot of abused labor, but it really went further. So for example, the um, sustainable apparel industry and the HIG index are some of the most mature work going on in uh, systems thinking of supply chain sustainability. Uh -oh. uh, starting to poke at is the, what about the motive? Who cares hmm. about the motive of a company? And with that, I know you've given your preamble about the company you're thinking about. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, in my opinion, it seems like business leaders that don't have a sustainable oriented mindset and are just purely in the business for profit and money um, won't take the opportunities to become more sustainable. Um, and have a more sustainable future. It'll be like this progress will be slowed down if leaders don't have that type of mindset. And an example I'd want to bring up is the North Face and how originally the original founder, I forgot his name, but he did have this sustainable oriented mindset and he had a lot of critiques of consumer culture and he left the business, he sold the business after two years because he didn't want to sell unnecessary things that people didn't need. Um, and like, the North Face going to this company in six years ago. They're selling $2,000 items. 
<laughs> Except for that, they're great. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear that their CEO is very sustainably minded, oriented, and driven. And it shows because that largely contributed to all these initiatives that they're pursuing, taking the first step in, and then a bunch of other companies seeing some follow suit. So, without that, it seems like progression would be far, like very decreased. And that's important because we are on a time limit here in reference to global warming. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What I was wondering is, do you think of business's success relative to the goal of having a more sustainable future depends largely on the leaders, the CEOs, motives, and perspectives on sustainability, or does it not really matter? Oh, I love that. That's a great question. It's a great question. And I think... It depends on like, the stage of business as well. Exactly. That's where you, you read my mind. You read the stuff. You read the homework. Um, yeah, I think it does depend on the stage of the business. Um, in early sledding, um, it really requires some championship to do things differently, especially if you're doing things radically differently. So absolutely. Later in the approach though, and certainly by the end, it may be the case that, I guess I would say that leaders will get it and there will be part of that ecosystem whether or not it's, you know, whether or not they have like, you know, th that's not their personal mission necessarily, it'd just be the definition. So a leader, uh, a CEO of a Fortune 500 company is a good accountant. That doesn't mean that he or she set out in life to be a good accountant, right? And just because to do the job, you better be, you know, you better be a good financier. Um, they're probably a good leader, even if they didn't set out to be a big leader or not. So I'm gonna de-emphasize in the end state, from the beginnings, absolutely. In the, in the, in the more mature stages, I'm gonna de-emphasize the motivation conversation. And I'll even be a little more provocative and I'll say that a little bit of that motivation conversation is baked into conventional wisdom that you gotta make a choice, it's either or. As I talked to my CFO, chief financial officer, when we're making decisions, once we figure out how to make money at it, nobody stops me. So I get to do a whole lot. And we could have bought a little renewable energy five years ago at a premium and patted ourselves on the back and called it good. We didn't. We spent about two years figuring out the renewable energy industry and how to do more sophisticated contracts. We brought in finance. We brought in treasury, legal, procurement, operations. And we really looked at the value proposition of where renewable energy could bring something to our business. In the end, we figured out how to make money at it. So our renewable energy contracts are net positive to the business. So for example, we have now gotten to about 80% of our global electricity portfolio, nearly a gigawatt of electricity consumption. 80% is from new renewable energy resources. And we've never paid more than grid for green power. So does that make us meat eating capitalists who figured out how to make money at it and so it doesn't matter? Or does that make us um, committed folks who thought of a different way? I'll tell you where my mic come down on it. it. The commitment around how to do it got us to a gigawatt of green power. We're able to drive, um, we're able to drive, drive change in the industry for the grid. And we're able to share that with others because even if we would have paid more for green power, Nobody else would have. So we couldn't have done much more of it. Right? And so we couldn't have shared that with other businesses and convinced them to come along when it's a tax on the good guys. So I think the, um, the opportunity that we've had with actually figuring out a business savvy way to implement it at scale meant that we not only could do it ourselves, but we can bring others with us. So we've part, we're part of the uh, Clean Energy Buyers Alliance a group of nearly a hundred businesses now, corporations that you've heard of, um, who are collectively buying over 60 gigawatts of new electricity, of new green power worldwide. So I think I can get excited about that. Um, now back to the top. So are the CEOs of all those, uh, or my own CFO, <laughs> um, like a, a zealot on, 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 uh, on sustainable business strategy? 
I don't know. I never had that conversation with him, but I know that he signs the deals. <laughs> They were early in the organic cotton business. They helped start the organic cotton program. Yeah. Absolutely. And, in fact, and I feel like if they if they didn't have that CEO leader to push those initiatives, other businesses would take a lot more time to do what they did. Yeah. And time is important. Yeah. A tweak. A tweak. Yeah. They have a founder, an owner yeah. who's committed. They've had five CEOs Perfect. since yeah. I've known them. Right. Um, all of whom have had different commitment levels, but are all committed. Yeah. I think that, um, so I think that the sustainable business movement approaches business with two main propositions. One is there's a business case and the other is you got to do the right thing. And frankly, when I'm in, you know, closed rooms with business leaders, the way that lands on people is that today they're doing the wrong thing. So they're immoral or they haven't figured out how to do their business. So they're stupid. So I think you're stupid or you're immoral is a terrible way to start. It was a terrible way to start a change conversation. I think that eventually when folks in my organization and both the organizations I've been in have seen in this context, have seen, um, have seen that there's a new way to think about it. Um, we get a whole new, we get a whole, whole new outcome. And we get more commitment, we get more emotion, but we get more head, right? We get head and heart. And I think that's, you know, we, we, I think people come to the conversation from all different doors and I'm okay with that. I don't care how you got in here. Now that you're here, let's get some work done. And I, I think that's, uh, that's kind of how I, how I boil it down. Um, ultimately, I think it's hard for people to see new ways of doing things and to adopt those new ways of doing things to see the results and still not think that it works. So I think that ultimately in higher levels of sophisticated business, people get there. But, you know, I, I use the Patagonia example a lot. And by the way, I know the folks at North Face really well. And, uh, and Letitia Webster was a classmate and ran sustainability at North Face and then went on to lead, uh, became the vice president of sustainability at VF Corporation. Um, It'll be interesting to see your report when you actually go through the go through the details, um, because yeah, there's some stuff there. Um, but what I think is really interesting is the is the juxtaposition of um, this whole conversation of you know do you mean it? Right? So let me tell you a quick story. I uh, we, it, when I was at REI, we bought it, 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 renewable energy. By the way, um, so we we were one of the first corporations to make a renewable energy deal at REI. And we also figured out a way to do it in a, in a business positive way. We made this big press release that we got, uh, that we got, um, and that we did this renewable energy contract for the co-op and we were all proud of it. And I got two emails within a day or two of each other with the same uh, subject line. It said, I can't believe you sold out my co-op. Oh, well, this is going to be interesting reading. Uh, so I opened the first one, and it was a co-op member from Alaska, not to be stereotypical again, um, who was saying, hey, what are you doing? You know, you're supposed to run a good business so that you can deliver great gear at a great price. This isn't like a political science project. Um, you're supposed to just run a really good business, and I don't care about your politics around this renewable energy stuff. So, you're right. In fact, it was the better business choice. We, we made a you know, million dollars or something on, uh, on our renewable energy choices. We're taking care of you on the business side. <laughs> the other one was, I can't believe you sold out my co-op. And it was an uh, employee. I guess I really am being stereotypical from Portland. <laughs> um, who said, I can't believe you sold out my co-op. If we're making money at this, Obviously, we don't really mean it. 
see, in my opinion, those folks were opposite. They thought they were opposites, but in fact, I think they were, this, they were two sides of the same coin. They had the same paradigm, either or. And to really rethink the way we're getting business done requires us to rethink the way we're thinking about that so that we get uh, different outcomes for the business, for the environment, and for people. And I think that the ultimate answer is what if the bigger we got, the more good we could do. And the more good we did, the bigger we got, which is provocative. <laughs> it was about your 80% renewable electricity that you guys have. And you guys had that in 2021, and that your plan was to reach 90% by 2025. And we didn't make any progress. In fact, we went backwards a little bit this year. Yeah. You're like, what the heck? Uh, but that's in four years. Um, and then, so you're going to do 10% in four years. And then your next to 100% is supposed to be like, like forever. <laughs> Years for 10%. Yeah, because it's hard. <laughs> um, juxtaposed against those percentage increases is a giant increase in our use of energy. We're building data centers by the hundreds of millions of dollars a year. And data centers are some of the most energy intense industry on the planet. We've actually, since 2016, tripled our amount of electricity use. Wow, what do you do with that, right? Ergo, why we figured out how to use renewables because over the same amount of time, we've cut our absolute greenhouse gas emissions by over 60%. So we've literally gone in two directions, growth and growth in the business and greenhouse gas emissions going down um, by a lot. So I think the, um, the, the, um, the, the answer is we're growing the business so fast, we have to improve by double digit percentages just to stay even. And that's why we're making slower progress in the out years. And then to kind of follow that, is, is while you guys are waiting, I guess like the renewable energy industry and like infrastructure catch up with you guys' with energy increasing like your consumption, is there anything that like your business is doing or like kind of not is doing to help support the energy industry and like promote? Great questions. Absolutely. We can't get there alone. We, you know, we can't. So Google, Microsoft, even Amazon buy way more renewable energy than we do. So we work with them, with all of them to collectively try to drive change in the industry, create new products and services. In fact, last year, our, wow, those are great questions. Um, last year, one of the big changes we made was that we have moved our definition of 100% renewable energy. Because today, folks count 100% renewable energy as you bought enough energy to cover your usage for the year. So we used a whole lot of energy during the year. And when we compare to how much energy we bought or how much we produced, for example, the solar panels on our buildings, that evens out and that comes up in our data center business to 100% and for our corporation to about 80%. But if you dig under the covers, it's, that's the way everybody does it. That's RE100, WRI, that's the way it's done. And it's really unsatisfying to us because as we dig under the covers to see a little more deeply, what we're finding is that big penetrations of renewable energy can actually get negative unintended consequences. What if we build more solar where it's not needed in the middle of the day? Arizona right now actually stops solar production in the middle of the day because they got too much of it and you can't turn off a nuclear power plant. So you can't turn off the power plant, so you got to keep it running. So what's left, the free electricity from the sun is being shut down because we got too much of it in the wrong place. Um, so we see that happening and that's you know an, an example of um, negative unintended consequences from driving, uh, driving the wrong goal. And so we've changed our thinking. Um, last year, we announced that we're now driving for what we call 24 seven carbon free energy. So matching every one of our facilities, every hour of every day with a local renewable energy source. 
and having that match so that we know where the next renewable should buy because we should buy it in places where there it's not on the grid already. That was a real geeky discussion of car of carbon free energy, my apologies, but it's an example of where you is exactly what you're asking. How do you think ahead to anticipate what's coming and how do you work with others to get those bigger impacts to happen. Anybody have uh, other questions about reading the, the report because you know basically I love the fact, thank you for reading the report. My team does an awful lot of work on it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question kind of just generally about trade-offs. Um, after reading the report and then also some of just like the five-step um, framework, it seems like you frame, like everything is a win-win, but that seems kind of no. contradictory to me because that's like how we were talking about earlier. It's hard to um, get your goals of like, reducing greenhouse gas emissions because you're building so much. And so it feels like almost with renewables, it's like you're playing a game of catch up against all the growth that you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering like, would it be possible to kind of stop the issue at the source and the source being um, just generally not specifically like for your business and like the source being like growth and how can we stop equating growth with kind of like success and development because that to me, like after learning about sustainability for like three years now as a student program on the environment, it seems like that is the root issue. And then this whole sustainable business thing is kind of just like taking advantage of like a market opportunity because everyone is realizing that yeah. <laughs> you can make money off of this stuff, but you're not actually like solving the root problem. I think you're right. In the early stages of, 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 of uh, sustainable business thinking, you haven't fixed the root cause, right? You're still working on rearranging the chairs right? or doing less bad, which is, you know, that's a good thing, I guess. It's a, to do less bad, right? Reduce your negative impacts, have less safety problems, have, you know, hurt less people, have less, uh, have less greenhouse gas footprint. Um, so I think that that's as early, you know, early winning. And that's, and a lot of people think that that's what sustainability is. And so if that's your only definition, then you're characterized it really well. As you get to higher levels of maturity, you start to think about how to do more good and therefore how to turn growth from a negative into a positive. What if we could do more good? So what if, in fact, we were able to um, provide new data center services because it's growing like crazy? Right? Um, carbon neutral data center services where somebody else was building data centers that still have a big carbon footprint. Well, we should win, right? <laughs> right? Um, and I think that if we were winning and we were building data centers and delivering data center services that were carbon neutral, then our customers don't have that problem. They have probably other problems, but they don't have that problem. And so therefore we are growing at the expense of somebody who is doing it poorly. In fact, when I'm really provocative, I say the goal of sustainable business is to put unsustainable business out of business as soon as possible. Other questions? We've got a couple on the table. We can just ask them and then we'll... Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had a question, and I'm going to contradict myself right now because I'm sitting in this paper in my lap. <laughs> but I was wondering how Iron Mountain is shifting its customers and itself away from paper or going paper. Awesome. <laughs> Other questions to put on the table? Uh, you um, mentioned in, our, I think you noticed in your report and also in your 10K that you have a zillion different locations. Uh, 1,450 that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, and so certainly it would seem like, you know, when you look at your electricity bill up there, there are an awful lot of different jurisdictions involved. And when you said we don't know whether we're paying more or buying more, well, you know, you've been a lot of work. Yeah, we didn't. We do now. Um, yeah. So, and with storing people's data, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with records management. Yeah, yeah. And it's very complicated. And certainly I, I did that at the University of Washington for a while. Now. Nice. And, you know, nice. Construction. But you have operations in Russia. Um, we don't anymore. We don't. <laughs> I know we covered it around, but I, I 
Well, we uh, our Russian operations closed about three weeks ago. So it would just seem like you know there that you would be aware of opportunities for um, new technologies that we uh, are over the place. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, both questions kind of get to a, a similar a similar route. How do you know? How do you know that this new technology is better? than what you're already using. I'm thinking in terms of environmental and social performance, right? Overall environmental and social performance, how do you know that what you're gonna do is better? How do we know that a data center is better than paper? Paper is a pretty good renewable resource. I mean, it's had a good run as a technology. Right? Um, maybe it ain't so bad, right? The amount of deforestation is like very, very significant, right? Although, just to be fair, not a lot of that deforestation is driving the paper industry. Yeah. But despite that, we're talking in terms of greenhouse gases. Land degradation is also another very important. Serious. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, so how do you look at all these consequences, environmental, social, and put them on some kind of a common metric so you can really understand what are the impacts i think and uh, I probably have worked on life cycle assessments right you start to see a little bit of what the life cycle assessment process looks like it can be really complicated and really you know in very very intense but as a theory you kind of get the, the idea um in fact we've been recently working really hard at trying to build life cycle assessment thinking into our product development and new process because we don't know. Um, and in fact, many times it's blind spots, thing which you don't know, you didn't know. So we've had a great conversation about, is paper better than data centers? And the answer is consistently, it depends. <laughs> so let's make sure we understand what those depends are and make sure that we align our business with the, with the better outcomes. And when, how do we actually create circular better outcomes so for example in the paper industry we are in north america we have a shredding business so all that all those documents have to be securely destroyed someday so we actually feed over six hundred thousand tons of paper to the pulp industry a year by recovering paper from the process and getting it back to pulp mills avoiding over 10 million trees cut being needed for new paper production so you're right, you're both right. How do you think about um, new, what's new? How do you think about growth in a way that, uh, that could you know, add value? How do we think about building a new facility that is carbon positive, is an asset to its community, is, a, is, is energy positive? Um, how can we make things that are better where they are instead of try to figure out how to do less bad? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we are really thinking about that. You know, Jim Hanna is doing some really good good work on this over at uh, over at Microsoft, thinking about the community impacts of data center construction, in particular, and data center operations. Yeah, this is a big this is a big challenge. We haven't found it. Yeah. So um, we're starting to think about mapping and charting our facilities and understanding our communities. Um, what are the effects of our business decisions in our community? Are we helping employment? Are we not helping? Are we helping people? Is there a positive impact? If we we're going to consolidate two buildings, how do we decide how to do that? Well, today, I'm not sure that we take into consideration what other consequences might happen around the building. And, and, yeah. So I think that um, I think that thinking of real estate as a tree, just to be poetic, um, can it help its forest? Can it help where it is? Can it make? Can it add value to its location? Is something that uh, that we're thinking a lot about, um, and we're trying to figure out how to quantify and measure it. So, for example, 
uh, are we locating our facilities in underserved communities? And if we did, was it on purpose <laughs> intentionally to build the job? We have a lot of great jobs for people with relatively modest skill sets or modest educational, lots of skills, not necessarily needed lots of education. So great, um, that's, a, that's a great alignment. And by the way, we need people. So what if we started to think about that as to how we locate and where we go? So those are the kinds of things we're thinking about. Um, I think historically corporations have thought about community impact as philanthropy and philanthropic dollars. And um, we're trying to get way past that. And even in the, in the aspect of philanthropy, we're trying to think about how do we bring more than money to partnerships and, and how can we do things that in our communities with partners that wouldn't have happened otherwise that are really needed by the community. So do you have any questions online? Uh, so on the report, I mentioned that some of the initiatives that are covered by some strategies from IMF can um, invest into carbon offsets in order to do <coughs> that. And so I'm kind of curious because I see this oh, with a lot of other companies too. They say they invest in credible carbon offsets, but what do you think makes a credible carbon offset? And it kind of just seems like a black box to me. Yeah, I agree. So we don't, there are a few places in the company where we actually have bought carbon offsets for whatever reason, but it's de minimis. It, I think we bought a arts business in London that had a thing where they were buying offsets for their customers in some way. So, I mean, it's really de minimis. Um, we hold the door open to offsets because I don't know how to get to zero greenhouse gas emissions at the end, um, but our whole emphasis for the next you know, 10 years is on driving down absolute production you know, sources of greenhouse gas emissions. And we'll see what happens at the end of that and how many, what, what we got to do then. My, uh, my other you know, hidden agenda is I'm trying to figure out ways that we make carbon offsets. Uh, for example, we have in many instances more roof than we need um, for if you were filling the roof with solar you would make more energy than the building needs. In fact, we have several buildings that are um, already energy positive uh, on an annualized basis. So maybe there's some business opportunities in that that uh, that that would you know that would open some doors. Prologis, the largest operator of warehouse facilities, I think anywhere, um, just made an announcement that they're up to 300 megawatts of installed solar on their roofs. Um, building out, uh, you know, amazing solar um, asset for the business. So uh, we're not doing it much. We have a few offsets in the business today, um, and I, uh, I haven't done enough thinking about exactly what's our metric going to be. I have my own biases, but that's not good enough. Um, but we haven't got a business decision on what's our what's our definition of a good offset yet, um, and I haven't worked on it too hard for, and I, I probably won't for a while. How's that for blatant, blatant honesty? <laughs> yeah, we're going to see how it goes. We're, we're, you know, we'll, maybe somebody smarter than me will figure it out, and then I can just copy them. Well, Kevin, thank you very much. Thank you, well, thank you guys. Thanks for, thanks for that maybe a little provocative. And I, I really appreciate the provocation back. That's uh, that's really helps me, and it really helps uh, helps our program at our.